Hey, this is Troy Taylor with the Championship Football Coaches Clinic on Totem Pole Sports. We have Jason Ma here tonight. Jason's my long uh, longtime friend. I uh, met him when he was coaching at Virginia Union University. He played at Virginia Union. Jason, how are you doing? Good, good, Troy. How are you, man? Long time. I'm no doing sleep. great. We're, we're just going to sit back tonight, y'all. We're going to talk about football, talk about life, talk about coaching, and talk about quarterback play. You know, something that I really love. But, you know, off camera, we were talking a little bit about Jason's story. Yeah. That, um, tell everybody at the clinic, you know, a little bit about yourself, where you're from, and how you ended up, you know, going all the way across the country. That was that was good. Yeah. So I'm I'm originally from the Bay Area in California. So San Francisco, Oakland area. Um, I, I grew up there, you know, went to high school, all that. Uh, did a year at a junior college and started getting recruited and was like, OK, I'm going to go ahead and and, you know, move on to the four year thing. So I had I had originally committed to us back in the day, you didn't really commit, you know, but anyway, Originally committed to a school in Montana um, and then a school in Minnesota eventually uh, reached out and it was, you know, a little bit bigger school and had a little, you know, was going to pay for everything really. So I was like, I'm going there. Like maybe June of that year, um, I got a call from the guy that's the head coach now at Virginia Union. He was the offensive, it was his first year as the offensive coordinator there. He gave me a call, said, hey, coach, or, you know, it was like, hey, Jason. Alvin Parker. Everybody yeah. calls him AP. Coach, right? AP, yep, yep, AP, AP called, and he was like, we'd be interested in, you know, seeing if he'd be interested to come out here and play some ball for us. And I was like, Richmond, Virginia is a city. I'm a city kid, as opposed to going, you know, up north where it wasn't necessarily as big of a city. I was like, yeah, I think I can handle that. And it was cool because – you know, he was he was he was really good about, you know, hey, it's a college town. Richmond, Virginia is you know, the three schools there. VCU's right down the street. Richmond's right around the corner. So I was like, all right, this, this is great. So um, I get my scholarship, sign it, send it back. And then I was on my way to Richmond maybe a month later, um, got there and it was great. It was it was a great experience. I had a great time. We played for a championship that year, and then uh, right before my senior year, we had a change of head coach, and I decided I was going to transfer. So I transferred and graduated somewhere, someplace else, and then eventually came back and started coaching there. Um, and have a lot of, a lot of friends that are still there. Um, you know, a lot of good memories in that place. Yeah, Jason. For, for y'all that don't know, I mean, we started the Coaches Clinic in 2009, and this year it's gone to a podcast. And, I mean, the Total Pole Sports, they're up to like 30,000 subscribers now. Jason has always, no matter where he was coaching, <laughs> he would fly, he would get there, he would come and speak at the clinic. So, Jason, can you tell us a little bit about where all you came from to, mm -hmm. to come to Richmond and speak at the Championship Football Coaches Clinic. So, my first year of coaching was probably the only year that I didn't do it. I was ga in Minnesota for a little over a year. From there, I ended up uh, – I came back to Union. I was there for the spring going into summer. I took another job down in Charlotte at Johnson C. Smith University. I want to say that was the first one. Then uh, – from John C. Smith, I went back to Virginia Union, uh, was at Virginia Union for a little bit, then went down to Winston-Salem State, which is right there in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and I subsequently got a house there. So that's kind of always been, that's been home base since. And so I would, it's about, what, three and a half, maybe four from Richmond, so I'd go back and forth. Um, and then from Winston-Salem State, I went to St. Augustine's. From St. Augustine's, I left and went to Hampton University. And then from Hampton University, I came down here to Alabama A&M, which is where I am now. So um, I still have the house up there in uh, in Winston. So I kind of it's a good deal. I'm able to kind of go home then come up, do the, you know, do the clinics or go out, do my recruiting and then come back down here. So. So, man, you, you've had a long journey. Uh, yeah. Your, your family. Are, are you from a coaching background? What, what, what did your folks do? No, no. My my dad uh, 
my dad owns a business now in California that he's owned for 20 something years. Mom uh, was a nurse and then now she lives in Texas. Uh, but no, nobody, a lot of sports fans. We've been 49er fans since I, I mean, I was, I was a baby wearing, you know, 49er stuff. Um, a lot of sports fans in the family, but I was the first, um, uh, I was the first college athlete. I'm the only one that's coaching. So, are are you a Golden State Warriors fan? Listen, <laughs> yes. Now, okay, yes and no. We had Warrior tickets back when nobody liked the Warriors. When Chris Mullins and, and Chris Chris Mullin and Run, yeah, yeah. What was it? Run yeah. TMC. Yes, yeah. So when it was like people would come would ask to use the tickets, depending on who was coming to town, versus. I don't want to see the Warriors. So now, whenever I go on Facebook, and with that's for all my high school friends and, and stuff like that, that's kind of where I keep track of everybody. I go in there, and it's it's Warriors for life and all this other stuff. And I'm like, no, dude. I, I remember. Like, hey, you guys want to go to the Coliseum tonight? We're going to go see the Warriors play? Eh, nah, we can do something else. Yeah, no. No, yes. So, yeah, we've had Warriors tickets, uh, just like 49er tickets for forever. Um, But, yeah, you know. Hometown, hometown team. Yeah, I've taken on the Memphis Grizzlies as oh. my team. I like John Morant because he was the underdog, you know, not recruited guy, no stars, cut from the camp mm. guy. And, man, your team beats my team every time, man. I stayed <laughs> up until 2 in the morning last night watching. It seems like I can almost watch more pro basketball than I can pro football, you know, coaching yeah. you know, high it's, school ball and having to prepare. I, I struggle to watch any – I got to turn the commentary down. If I'm going to watch any any sports, I got to turn the commentary down because it's like I don't know. You know, it's almost like you should have like a like for us, our players. I can see how much film they've watched in a week, right? Like on on DV Sport 360. So I would want to see how much film the commentators are watching before they come in here with all this expert opinion. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Just because sometimes you'll be watching, especially if it's football, it's like they'll, they'll start talking about something. And as a somebody, I've been, I've been coaching it for a long time. I've been playing since I was like eight. You know, that's almost 30, some, almost 40 years now. Like, you know, what you're saying is absolutely wrong. <laughs> and everybody's listening to you right now. So it's, it's tough for me to watch any kind of sports without. You know, so, so, like Madden, he, he yeah. was the guy that made it fun and he made it easy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then, like Gruden, I mean, he was uh, he was amazing. You know, I, yes. I'm really upset that he went back to pro football and left Monday Night Football because he was a national treasure. And hopefully, right. he'll be back one day because he was the best color commentator of all time, man. I mean, that guy, he did his homework. So I, now, I mean, Romo, I guess, is the best right now, right? He's good. I mean, He's pretty good. He's and he's good. a quarterback like you. So, I mean. He's right. So, he's been in it. He knows it. Like, when something's going on, you know, somebody's making a change or something, he should know what's going on and, and kind of working from it. And, and even, like, when he said, okay, I'm, I'm betting they're going to, you know, I'm the, he's going to go right here or whatever, he's usually right because he's, you know, he's been in it long enough to know. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Um, so, yeah. yeah. He's pretty good. And so, I, Troy Aikman, I guess, is a mi- kind of a mix between Madden and mm-hmm. – Groot yeah. or v- Romo, and I, yeah. Chris Ol- Chris Olsen's pretty good, but yeah. Chris Collinsworth is the worst. Yeah, <laughs> I, mean, I, I can't believe. Yeah. You know, he's still yeah. on NBC. Yeah, um, you know, I guess uh, the guy from uh, Barstool he really gave them a hard time. You know, on that yeah. kick, but there was a penalty on the field goal. So I mean. You didn't know whether that was going to be the field goal that was going to end the game or not, right? Um, when Dave Portnoy got so upset, so yeah. yeah, I'm gonna have to start turning it down too, man. I, um, yeah, this is what I I mute it, watch it, and kind of roll from there. So you've been to all these different colleges, and how many different head coaches have you worked for? And you know what have you learned from you know those guys? So one, two. Three, four, really five head coaches. I've worked with Coach Maynard in three different places. I worked with him at Winston. I worked with him at, at Hampton. I worked with him here. 
I worked with Tim Chavis at uh, St. Augustine's. I worked with Keenis Bulwer at uh, Winston-Salem State after Coach Maynard had left. Um, I worked for Arrington Jones for a little bit, and then Richard, uh, Greg Richardson, great coach. Um, Daryl McNeil, Eric Eidsness, Mike Bailey. I think that's everybody. That's everybody. So I just kind of got to go back through my head there, man. Um, you know what? I I have found as an assistant coach, you're going to learn something from every head coach. Sometimes it, you're going to learn what to do. Sometimes you're going to learn what not to do. You know what I mean? Um, so I've, I've had some, you know, with like even, you know, with Coach Maynard, there's not – I don't know that there's a better natural play caller than Coach Maynard. He doesn't do it now, but – when he was calling, when he was the head coach at Winston, he was the head coach, quarterbacks coach, and the OC. And I learned so much just in, you know, the way he prepared for a game, the way that he called a game, just the way in game he can make decisions. He was good. You know, and what is his background? Because I, I don't know much about Coach Maynard. I remember they pl he played for the national championship. You know, yeah. Yeah, went from NAA. But what's his background? Yep. So he was um, he was at North Carolina a t He's well. Originally, he started out as a player at Winston-Salem State. Transferred to North Carolina A&T when Bill Hayes took the job at North Carolina A&T. He played there, finished up there. He's a Hall of Famer there. He's a Hall of Famer in the MEAC as a player. Then he went to arena football, and it's crazy because when I was a kid, um, you know, high, before and during high school, I was a ball boy for the San Jose SaberCats, which is an arena football team in San Jose, right? And they were in the AFL. They were in the one that played on ESPN right one. at night. Yeah, the one that got really big. So um, I was there for a lot. Of, you know, wow, geez, I did it for maybe five or six years. But we, I knew who Connell Maynard was from that wow. before I knew him as a coach because he was just – he was a very good arena football quarterback. Like, if they have a Hall of Fame, which I assume they will, he would be in it because he's – he's that dynamic, you know what I mean? As a player. And so it was one of those things. Um, he went on to, I want to say his last job in the arena league or playing in the arena league was Phil was either New York or Philadelphia or Orlando, one of the three. Then he started coaching there. He was coaching the arena league and coaching at Fayetteville state. He was like the quarterback's coach at Fayetteville state. I was playing at uh, Virginia Union, we played against them in the championship. Actually, the quarterback the for uh, Virginia – or no, I'm sorry, for Fayetteville State was Dwayne Taylor. That's our OC here. Him and I have been playing against each other since we were in college. And, you know, we had kind of a back-and-forth relationship. It was interesting. Um, and then uh, Coach started coaching at Fayetteville full-time, became the offensive coordinator, and then eventually moved up to be the head coach at – uh, uh, Winston-Salem State. So that's kind of how that happened. And was Dwayne, was he at Norfolk State? No, Dwayne was at Coach Taylor. DT was at Fayetteville State as a player. Then he was, uh, he was with me at Hampton when we started coaching there. Uh, he was with us at Winston-Salem State. And then he's here now. Well, he was here. He just left now and is coaching in the XFL. So. So you know the whole – I mean, you probably know more about it than even me. Um, you know, I coached at Virginia Union for three mm -hmm. years for Coach James. But, you know, with Dion going to Colorado and that whole fiasco that occurred with Ed mm -hmm. Reed, like, man. I mean, yeah. what I mean, what a mess. I mean, what yeah. what is your what is your take on that? You know, being you know a position coach in, in HBCU, and then with what's going on with, I mean, not just I mean, I don't even know the whole story about Dion, something about his daughter, but with the Ed Reed situation down there at Bethune in Daytona Beach. So uh, let me back up first and say I'm on record as saying. I didn't like the idea of Jackson State hiring Deion Sanders. I didn't think it was, you know, the the I, I didn't think it was going to work, and I was wrong. They they I was and now I can still say I didn't like it because they beat us twice. Now we were the last SWAC team to beat them. Like in the spring season, we won the the conference championship. We were the last SWAC school to beat Jackson. Mm -hmm. uh, but once he got rolling. It was tough because he brought a lot of attention to the SWAC that 
it wouldn't have gotten without him, right? And so, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll eat that one. Um, as far as what Bethune was doing, I think, you know, I think trying to replicate something like that with a guy like, uh, you know, with what, um, with Deion Sanders, you know, trying to replicate that at Bethune with Ed, you know, with Coach Reed, I guess, um, that's tough because, you know, my mom knows who Deion Sanders is without thinking. You know what I mean? His brand is his brand. And and it's and it's big. Ed Reed, I know who Ed Reed is, and I'm sure that if I talk my mom through it, she could probably figure out who he was. But it's a different animal. You know what I mean? Um Dion was going is going to bring notoriety to your program uh just based on the fact that his brand is what it is. I think uh, Bethune thought that by just grabbing a guy that had been at that level that, and, and that is obviously passionate about the kids and wanting to do right by them, um, they thought it was just going to, to have the same takeoff effect that it did with Dion. And it, and it, it obviously didn't. And I, I can see, I can see both sides of the argument here. I, I can see, uh, Ed Reed's frustration because he really, you know, is passionate about helping the kids. And he, he says it all the time. It's about the kids, it's about the kids. He's doing, he's laying money out of his own pocket to try to improve things there and, 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 you know, give them what they need. Um, but I can also like most of us coaches know the things that you say on social media, the things you say, uh, in public, you know, reflect not just on you, it reflects on the program, it reflects on the school, it reflects on the president of that school, the alumni of that school, the alum, you know, the, the board of trustees of that school. And so, you know, when you have millions of followers and they're listening to what you say, you have to be very selective in what you say, whether you're right or wrong, because it can always be misconstrued, taken out of context, or just outright, you know, have been the wrong thing to say online and it's everywhere and it never goes away. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so, without a contract. So, and, I mean, yeah, that's and that's a whole different deal. That and again, again, that's what I'm saying. Like I, I can kind of see both sides because, you know, coming in the door, I would think that you'd want to have a contract on your, you know, or a contract being imminent, not months, not a month go by and there'd be no contract and you're just kind of there on campus because that opens the university up. You would think as a university you'd want to take care of that fast because it opens you up to you know, uh, liability issues and things like that. If we're negotiating a contract, I shouldn't be walking around as the head coach of a university on live stream. I just shouldn't, you know what I'm saying? Because anything can happen and, and there's no, nothing on paper, black and white to, that's going to explain the limitations and things that are going on here. So I, it, it's crazy. Um, and, and I feel for, I really, at the end of the day, I feel for the kids. I really feel for those kids there because now that this has happened and it's gone as long as, long as it's gone, you're, you're so late in the recruiting game that, like, I mean, you're hurting. You are, you are hurting, you know what I mean? And then, you know, those guys, the coaches that are there on campus now that are working for him or, or that were, you know, waiting for a new head coach. Now they're kind of stuck in the weeds. And then like whichever, whomever it is that eventually takes that job, because like my head coach says all the time, they're going to kick that ball off in, in September. Okay. So someone's going to be there, you know, that person's going to have a long road to hoe with, even with just the kids that are there, you know, late, based on what I've seen, a lot of kids that are there are really, we're really excited to play for Ed Reed and wanted to play for him. And so now the university has kind of decided to go another way, has decided to go another way. And so now those kids can kind of, you know, they're going to hold on to that and be a little upset. And then, you know, he's the next guy's going to have to come in here and, and try to build a program and, and pick up the pieces. So that, that's going to be a challenge for anybody. So you played quarterback and you're a big guy. I mm -hmm. mean, you're six foot four, six foot five, 240 pounds when you played, 220 what? Oh, when I played, I was at my biggest, which is right there in that picture, my senior year, I was like 215, 220. Okay. So, so, I mean, you're, you're not small. No. Nah. What, I mean, do you have a preference 
for your quarterback? I mean, because um, yeah. I, I got into a discussion about Josh Allen and Joe Burrow. Okay. And who who would I pick? And Ooh. I had said Josh Allen. Because okay. I thought he was more escapable. But now Joe Burrow, he can live in the pocket. Yep. And he just slices teams up. Yeah. Um, and is Josh Allen from California? Yeah. I know he went to a JUCO. Pretty sure he is. So, yeah. like, what, what's your take on that? I mean, there's different types of quarterbacks. Um, is there one right type? Um, what what so, do you look for? What do you believe? The, well, the right type is the one that's going to win games. I, I want a winner. You know what I mean? That's always kind of been, and everybody's going to say, well, everybody wants a winner. Yeah, okay, I want somebody who's actually won, though. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, you, you have you have to build your offense around, you know, we, it's, a, it's a mantra for us, play to our strengths, opponents, weaknesses. So if I have a quarterback that is, um, you know, more of an athletic guy that can, that can run and move, I'm going to do that if that's his wheelhouse. If – I have a guy like my last quarterback, a Quill. I mean, he's number nine all time FCS passing, and I might be faster than him. So, you know, it, one of the things like we're going to play to his strength, right? So, um, you know, but if, you know, you're in a situation where you got to go out and recruit, accuracy is my biggest thing. I, I want somebody who's accurate. I want somebody who can stay in the pocket and handle that pressure because those are things that you, that are tougher to teach than anything else. You know what I mean? Arm strength can be developed somewhat, um, you know, how to read a defense, decision-making, I can help you with that. What I cannot teach you is to be a brave person in the quarter, you know, in the pocket and really be able to handle a pass rush and deliver the ball. And then accuracy is a, is a difficult deal to teach because it really comes down to mechanics at that point. You can only tweak mechanics so much, particularly in college. So, you know, you really want to look for a guy who's going to be accurate with the ball and, and you know, has some guts to him. So, like, I I went live at, I think it was f around 5 o'clock, and I was talking about recruiting and basically the three tests. And I was talking about the grades test, then you mm -hmm. go to the eyeball test, and then mm -hmm. you go to the film test. And I think that probably playing quarterback on the high school level is probably the hardest position to get recruited to play yes. because there's so many checkoffs that have to occur. You mm -hmm. know, the area guy, the quarterback coach, the coordinator, the head coach. Is the head coach going to ride or die with that guy? Right. So, like, what do you look for in a quarterback's film? I mean, because a lot of guys throw screens. A, guy, a lot of guys throw bubbles. A lot of guys throw hitches. Right. Uh, you know, what should a quarterback put on their film if they want to get recruited? So the first thing is I, on a highlight film, because when, even when you're looking at a highlight film, you, you're looking at the best of somebody, right? I want to see the ability to get the ball out of your hand quickly. You got to give me some clips of that, right? And so that's going to be your quick game throws, you know, RPO type decisions, quick decisions. All right. Obviously, we need to see you be able to stretch the field and, and make some throws downfield, right? So you got to have some completions that are going to be beyond 15 to, you know, 28 yards, somewhere in there, right? Those throws need to be kind of like in-stride throws if you can, right, if you have it. And then for me, comebacks, curls, digs, on time in the right spot. That's what I want to see. Like, that's, that is big to me. You know what I mean? Um, I, I've watched a lot of films along the way where guys take snap, you know, big three hitch, and then just chuck it down the field. You do that enough on film, and it's like, okay, yeah, you can do that. You don't have to be super accurate for that. But, you know, who are you throwing to? Is he just bigger than the guy you're throwing against, right? Which can, okay, you can make good decisions with the ball, but I've yet to see you throw a 15-yard dig between the numbers and the hash and the, and the receiver not have to stop not have to slow down, not have to change direction, right? So that um, – and then, like, for me, in a perfect world, I try to get a – I want to see a game film. I, you know, and it's one of those – it's a weird deal. Like, back in the day, we used to have to send three game films and your highlight. 
when you were being recruited. It's the same thing. I want to see your three best games. Now, if you, you know, for me, I can, in theory, do it with one, you know, because I want to see what happens after you get hit. I want to see what happens after a guy drops the ball. I want to see what happens when you score, and I want to see what happens when you throw a pick. I just want to see how you react to it, whether you come out there and make that same mistake twice, whether or not you, you know, what's your body, you know, what, what, you know, who are you? I can, you can learn a lot by just looking at somebody's body language when they make a mistake. You can learn a lot about a quarterback from that. You can learn a lot about a quarterback in the way that he celebrates with his teammates, the way that he react, you know, interacts with his teammates. So game films are almost better for a high school guy. You know what I mean? Yeah, I want to see your highlight film. And then if that if you check some of those boxes or most of those boxes, I'm, I usually want to try to get a game film on you. And it's one of those deals where sometimes you have to kind of call around and try to figure out a way to get it, be creative about it. But, you know, that that would be the most ideal way to see it. Um, and then after that, I'm big on when I come to see you or if I come to see you, you know, obviously, you know, you, you don't want a kid who's going to kind of big time you or you know, whatever. Obviously, that could be difficult. Um, but I, I want I want to know what your teachers think about you. I want to know what your head high school coach thinks about you. You know what I mean? I, I've got buddies that run seven on seven leagues and seven on seven teams. And, I, and I love them and I take their opinions. But I want to know the guy that you're playing for on Friday night when you're going to war. I want to know what he really thinks. of You, you know what I mean? Um, I want to ask, sometimes I want to ask teammates, hey, you know, how, because all those things kind of come into play. When you're bringing a quarterback into college, particularly as a freshman, you know, that's a tough situation because you're used, generally speaking, you're used to being the guy. You know what I mean? And when you're coming in, unless you're in a, in a unique situation, you're probably battling to be a backup in theory. You know what I mean? Um, now, not to say that a freshman couldn't start, but and we give the freshman an opportunity. If you're here in camp, you're you're competing for a job. But at the end of the day, you know, in a, in a well-run program, you're probably battling to be the backup. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And so that's going to be a culture shock in itself. On top of the fact that you're away from mom and dad, right, for the first time. No one's there to wake you up. There's no bell to go to class, right? So bringing a kid in off the street that you don't know – how they react, what, you know, how they are as a student, how they are when things don't go well, how are they when, you know, how are they as a person around campus? You know what I mean? When you don't know those things, that can, that can be tough. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. So you, you got to have a high character guy. You, you don't want to have a turd bird or somebody mm -hmm. with an attitude problem or a diva. Right. You know, be a cancer on your team. Right. Um, you know, as far as running the ball, as a quarterback, I remember when we used to watch guys and I'd look at a high school guy and, mm -hmm. you know, he'd scramble and then he'd run 10, 15 yards and get tackled. And then I'd mm -hmm. always be like, well, dude, that was his first run and he's not cribbing that junk against the high school team. <laughs> like, he's not going to be cribbing it in the CIAA. And it makes me think of Zach Wilson. You know, when right. he was the quarterback at BYU, he couldn't beat Coastal Carolina. And there's not many people on Coastal Carolina's defense other than Josh Norman that's probably ever played, you know, multiple right. years in pro football. Mm -hmm. But everybody on that NFL defense is an NFL football player. So, mm -hmm. I mean, well, I mean, how important is that running the ball from the quarterback position? Or was I just putting too much emphasis on that? It, it's really just about, for me, it's really just about the ability to pull the ball down and get. You know, get if, he, if if a kid can pull the ball down and get 10, you know, and then he can still check the boxes throwing the football, that that's a that's talented to me. Like you know Trevor Lawrence, like in the in that playoff game when he would take off and the dude is just so big when he puts his shoulder down, he's right. getting six yards. Or right. like I thought Josh Allen. Right. Well, yeah, like and then so like, you know, I mean that and that comes with having a bigger guy, but just a guy who's willing or able to to extend a play, you know, and, and put his body out there to get that first down. You know what I'm saying? That That's pretty talented. Because, you know, like you said, okay, his first run wasn't a touchdown. Right. The guys blocking for him are high school guys. You know what I'm saying? The guys he's blocking against are high school guys. It's all kind of relative. You know what I'm saying? If you don't have 
you know, if I'm able to put better players around the same guy who might get that block, right, or he might not even have to take off because he's got somebody he can throw that's going to be open, that can all play into it. You know what I'm saying? So it's it is um, it's a it's more of a it, it's it's more of a science than it is an art. You have to kind of look at it and be able to kind of project it out. Yeah, I mean, nobody, I mean, if there was a guru, like yeah. that thing with Belichick, they say, well, you were so smart. You took Tom Brady in the sixth round. He said, well, if I was so smart, I would have taken him in the first round. Well, you know? Yeah. Like nobody would have thought that Tom Brady would have became Tom Brady. And it's right. kind of like we were talking I think earlier about John Morant. Like, mm -hmm. do the goats have something in them where – They've been told, like Aaron Rodgers, he's a, a California guy. You know, they just came out of who's on Rogan talking about the lady at Cal Berkeley told him, you're not going to play pro football. And it's oh, like that. No. that no, no, no. There were, there were, okay, Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers went to junior college out of high school. So there were 12 Pac 12 teams at the time that didn't think he was good enough to play for them. There was a, at least three or because he's from California, there was there's at least three or four FCS schools in in the state that could have taken you, uh, and that doesn't even get into the whack. Well, yeah, the whack of the Mountain West or any of them that were still, you know, that was all still happening. So a lot of people passed on him for him to end up at Butte College and then from Butte College go to Cal. Um, like I said, it's it's a deal where you are luck plays in. I hate to say it that way, but if you know you put in the right situation, when, when all those things kind of line up, you can get a great player from anywhere. You know what I'm saying? Um, there are some things, like I said, that you just got to look for, and you know, you, you, some markers that you kind of look for to say, "Hey, okay, this is a guy." But it you don't know until the guy's on the field. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I guess you know when, when it comes to you know, pro style quarterbacks and mm -hmm. athlete quarterbacks. I mean, I, to be a guy that can play from the pocket and be a pro style quarterback, it takes time. So I just, is that head coach willing to invest the time that that right. guy's going to become that? Or, hey, we're just going to take an athlete and we're going to run the ball and, you know, play backyard football. But I, maybe I'm oversimplifying. No, no, no. I, the thing. I struggle with that sometimes because it's like I've seen as time has gone on, I'm starting to talk like an old man. I've seen schools kind of almost get to find the best athlete on the field, put him at quarterback and run him. Right. I've seen that, you know, uh, and it, maybe it works for some people. I don't know. Um, I know that for us, if when we bring in an athletic quarterback, the goal is to over the course of his career, help him improve in being a pocket passing quarterback. Let's let's we've got that skill set, right? And we're going to build around that skill set. But in order to improve, we, we're going to, you know, in the off seasons, in the spring, even during the season, we're, we're going to try to teach you to kind of work as a pocket guy so that that becomes a bonus for you. You know what I mean? Uh, it becomes an additional tool. Um, when you try to, you know, pigeonhole a kid into being just a running quarterback, you know what I'm saying? Or just, you know, whatever. It, I think that it, it does a disservice to the kid. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, I want to ask you something about quarterbacks footwork and watching Tom Brady and watching, I think Aaron Rodgers does it now when these, I mean, guys used to cheat right-handed quarterbacks used to cheat their left foot back. Now, mm -hmm. like Tom Brady and and Aaron Rodgers in the gun, they're cheating their right foot back, and then they're taking a step behind with their left foot and then taking a step with their right, and they're really taking a five-step drop from under the center, making it a two-step, or yep. you're taking an extra step out of out of it. Um, yeah. I mean, is that something that you've seen? Is that something that you coach? Yeah, um, so I think at the pro Where did that all come from? So I, I think at the pro level, it's more about their – it's more of a comfort deal and a timing deal for them, right? At at our level, the way that we set our quarterback's feet and the way that we we do it, uh, particularly in the gun, is is strictly about timing. Um, if I want you to be able to throw rhythm three, let get the ball out right now. I don't. I need 
the left foot staggered halfway back, right foot rock across step throw, right? If we're trying to get just rocker and throw and I need you to throw the left with your left foot slight stagger, I'm just going to have you step over with your right step down, left throw ball, right? Going to the right, I'm just popping my hip to throw, right? You know, with the old rocker step. So um, it, I, it, it should always, your footwork should always work for timing. You know what I mean? Being at the right spot at the right time to let the ball out. And we have, and so like with, in our offense, we have base footwork for every concept, right? This is a rocker step. This is ghost three. This is rhythm three. This is big three. Uh, this is big three with a hitch or whatever. Um, and, you know, people call it different things. But um, for us, that's a baseline. When we get to, you know, we're repping it, you know, all right, this might work better for you as a rhythm three as opposed to a big three. You know what I mean? This might work for you better as a ghost three just so we can get the ball out of your hand and that, so that you're in position to be ahead of the receiver. You know what I'm saying? Um, you know, at the pro level, it's it's a little different. I met, Well, based on my conversations with a couple of pro guys, it, you know, most of those guys have some – this is some non-negotiable things. This, you know, on, on inside zone out of gun, you got to drop your foot type deal, right? But after that, it's really coming down to like, hey, let's let's build around, you know, what make what makes you comfortable and, and you're able to deliver the ball on time. So it, it's really timing for us. Okay, right on. So, you know, working for a coach who's a head coach and played quarterback and you know, <laughs> coach quarterbacks. Mm -hmm. I mean, is there anything that Coach Maynard is like a non-negotiable for him with a quarterback? Is it height? Is it speed? Is it arm strength? I mean, what what yeah. is it that he looks for? Um, he wants the ability to escape. You know, you don't have to be an absolute dual threat, but if you are a if you are a uh, a pocket guy, you have to have the ability to escape. At least be able to show the ability to escape, right? Um, he's like me, our accuracy. And then he likes to look at records. He really yeah. does. He wants to know whether or not you're a winner. You know, you know I mean? that makes me think of like Bill Parcells rules for drafting a quarterback. And one of them was like, he's got to be at least a three-year starter. And if you look at guys mm -hmm. like Jay Schrader with the mm -hmm. Redskins or, um, like Dwayne Haskins, when he got picked by the Redskins, those guys were only one-year starters in college. Right. So like, Oh, Mitch Trubisky was yeah. one year. So, I mean, I guess even in high school, I mean, Big Ben was only a one-year starter because the coach's son was the quarterback or whatever. But right. you're right. Like, it's kind of like Coach Ron Prince said when he was the head coach at Howard, we want unspoiled kids from unspoiled programs. We want captains on championship teams. Mm -hmm. And when you're the quarterback, I mean, it's got to be the hardest – thing to do in in sports maybe hit a baseball is pretty hard but i mean yeah, but you, you get those like, guys throw it over the plate and you're not getting hit in the head or but so. even like in in baseball if you're if you're one for th well if you're three out of ten you're a hall of famer mm -hmm. okay in college football any football you're completing three out of ten passes you're not playing oh yeah you know so you can get it right three out of ten times in, in baseball and be a hall of famer you can get it right three out of ten in football Playing quarterback, you're not playing. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it, 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 like I said, there's a lot to it. Trying to find a way to balance, obviously, statistical and then being able to project what he can do looking at a skill set. You know what I'm saying? Those, you know, and that's why, again, you know, for every great quarterback that you know, you know, for every uh, Connell Mayner, there's Jason Mai out there. You know what I'm saying? Just was there. You know what I'm saying? So uh, it, it's it's definitely a science, man. Man. Yeah, I, I guess what, I guess that's saying, Jimmy Johnson, if you got two quarterbacks, you got none. But, I mean, if you got none, then – I mean, is y'all's offense – is it prepared to be able – to not have a quarterback. I mean, what if y'all have a guy, He maybe he gets hurt or, you mm -hmm. know. I mean, so you, what, what do we do if you got a guy that really can't throw the ball that well? I mean, maybe even yeah. in high school because you can't recruit. So you 
you know, again, like you have to be able to design what you do about around a guy's skill set. This year, we, you know, our our uh, Aquil uh, was our starting quarterback in 2021. Like I said, ninth all time FCS passing. Uh, we had two quarterbacks this year that had to play because, you know, either one of them were really ready to be the starting guy, which, you know, made me look bad, right? Um, <laughs> but they, you know, they both played a little different. Quincy was more of a pocket guy that that wasn't going to take off on your ex. Xavier was more of a running quarterback. And so when we started with Quincy, we were doing things that were more quick second level RPO and, and quick game, get the ball out of his hand, let him get a couple early completions, get rolling type stuff, right? Uh, when X came into play, it was one of those things we kind of, okay, we'll do some of the first level, run, you know, inside zone read, quarterback power, power read, quarterback, you know, stuff like that, because that helped him get a little more settled in, give him a little early success, and then let it start rolling, you know, from there. Um, <clears throat> like I said, if, you're, if your quarterback can't throw – you know, a 12 yard route, then if you're running anything over 12 yard, in my mind, it, it better be a runoff to clear out for something else. And then I'm going to move him and let him attack, you know, make, make defenses play him and give us that 12 yard window. You know what I'm saying? But it's, it, like I said, it's, it really is geared around understanding what you have at quarterback, who he is, right? What are his strengths? And then working in those as much as you can. I've seen quarterbacks that, that were, you know, super athletic, uh, be put in a situation where they're, they're kind of put the clamps on them and it ruined their career, you know. At the same time, I've seen guys that couldn't throw a rock in the ocean, right, but could throw that tunnel screen with the best of them and have amazing stats and, and you know, people looking at them when it's like, yeah, throw a curl. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So – so that's how you saw it, but like Coach Saban was getting a hard time on social media because Brock Purdy's high school coach said that Saban thought he was average. But I mean, Saban had Jalen Hurts, Tua, Mac Jones, and who knows who else. I mean, these guys got like a, a pro football team mm -hmm. every year. I mean, what did you think about that? Because Saban had Philip Sims from <laughs> from Virginia Beach. Yeah, Philip Sims played for me at, at Winston Salem State to finish his career in 2014. I coached him. Okay, I've never seen a ball come out of a kid's hand quite like that kid. What does that mean? That means that we are human. We can get it wrong. He there's no he had no business not being at Alabama. He definitely didn't have any business being at at Winston Salem State. That kid had a pro arm. You know what I mean? I mean, that's why he made it. I mean, he went right. he went to the league. I, I don't I don't know how long he stayed or if he played in a regular season game, but Phillip, he's now the head coach of Princess Anne. He just mm -hmm. left J.R. Tucker. And he's okay. in coaching here in Virginia. Yeah, and man, I mean, he could fling it, he could spin it. And when I say football smart, he as a as a as a player, as a senior in college, he was as prepared, if not maybe more than some of the coaches on staff that year. You know what I mean? He was incredibly intelligent and fun. I, I loved the kid. I loved being around the kid. Um, and like I said, I've, I've never seen anybody throw a backside 15-yard comeback like that since. And I had, like I said, I have a quill who's playing in the USFL now. And he was talented, accurate as I'll get out. But Phil could put so much rotation on that ball. It was insane. So what that means to me is that there's, there's outside things that, as a coach, you, one, you can't control, right? I've had – I had a very talented quarterback here that I just could not get to do the right thing in the classroom, and I lost him because of it. And it hurt me as a coach. It hurt the program. But that happened. You also can – you know, when you're looking at recruits and you're seeing guys as they come in, you know, there's some things that you just can't see until, like I said, he's on the field for you. So – you know, now the other part to that is this: uh, How many championships did Brock Purdy win in college football? I mean, I, Iowa State had had I know had a good year. Stan Campbell was, I think that's his name. How many conference championships though? I mean, I probably none. Win. How many national championships? No, none, right? So I think Nick Saban got it right because in that time, I'm pretty sure he won at least two, right? 
Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I now, mean, I remember many years he don't win it. Right. Now, you add to that where Brock Purdy's playing right now, and I'm not downing Brock Purdy. He's talented. He's very talented. And for a, a, a rookie quarterback to step into a team like that and play the way he's playing right now, like like a, like a vet, you know what I mean? He's getting it done. And, and I take my hat, my, I truthfully take my hat off to Kyle Shanahan because he's done a great job managing and helping that guy to be, you know, in a situation that he shouldn't be in. Right. But you add to that, that's probably arguably the best as far as total team in the league to my, you know, that defense is going to put him in situations where, you know, they've got a chance going into the fourth quarter, no matter who they're playing, because they're going to keep it close enough for him. You know what yeah, I mean? And then they run the ball. You got, and they got, boot leg. Yeah, to play that. Good luck. <laughs> you got uh, McCaffrey, Debo, Mitchell, like, yeah, yeah. York. <laughs> and then, and then you know, you add to it like in, like most defensive coordinators that I've talked to, the most irritating thing in the world to them is is a really good tight end that you got to play both. You know, they can block yeah. and, and you know, so you know, come on now, get Kittle. So, uh, and then the you know the way. Coach Shanahan's offense is set up with, you know, with the boot game. And then, uh, you know, obviously I think everything for him break builds off of wide zone week. And then he works towards, you know, uh, boot away from that, some inside, some true inside zone. And then uh, uh, he runs, he's running counter gap, man. Counter the gap. Guard and tackle. I mean, yes. And, and so packaging all that up with the movement and all that stuff that helps. Mm-hmm. And that, again, that's an example of what I'm talking about. You have to play to what your guy can do. It's not a it's not a quarterback centered offense, right? He's not back there. He's not asking him to sit back there and you know, uh, you know, Manning. Yeah, like, Manning. just like Tony Romo was saying about Burrow, he was saying that he's paid Manning. You know, he's I got say two that, by two, and he's pretty much calm. Yeah, I want to say. Yeah, I want to say that. that that and Burrow yeah. said they check with him and let him call whatever concept he wants side to side and go from there. Or he, I think he's doing it on runs too. Like that's a different deal. You know, they're not asking Brock Purdy to do that. You know what I'm saying? So again, for for Brock Purdy's high school coach to come out and say, "Well, Nick Saban got it wrong on this kid," maybe, <laughs> but he won two national championships. So I, if I get it wrong and still win two national championships, I'm still going to be the highest paid coach in college football, and I'm be all right. <laughs> yeah, so. he's still Nick Saban. So, Nick so here, here's another thing that if you look at the quarterbacks that are still playing in pro football right now, you got Jalen Hurts, who's from Texas. His dad yep. was a high school coach. You got mm-hmm. Joe Burrow. His dad was defensive coordinator at Ohio University. I think he was an assistant at Nebraska at one time for Frank Solich. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know what Brock Purdy's dad was but I mean his high school coach is talking so I assume he's not a coach yeah, then you got Mahomes who his dad was a pro you know major league pitcher mm-hmm. so I mean be, being the son of a coach I mean it, is that something well I'll, I'll put it to you like this I have a 10 year old son if you look at my Twitter he's he takes he goes to school online virtual you look at my Twitter he's in my meeting room he does his schoolwork virtually in my meeting room, and then he's in there when we have our quarterback meetings. He comes out to practice and, and throws with the guys and stuff like that. Everybody that has met that kid has said the same thing. He's either going to be a pro football player or a pro coach because he he just at 10 years old, he's elbow deep in it. So it, being a kid, a coach's kid, I mean, I imagine that's got to be extremely helpful for any quarterback. Because you're gonna, you know, Brett Favre. I mean, that, that's being spoon fed to you. It's it's your life, and and you know, as a coach, all of us coaches know our families are sometimes in order to see us, they have to be around the game. There's just no other way around it. Because if not, you're not going to see me from August until December anyway. You know what I mean? So, like my daughter and and my son, my my older son. They've all been around football since they were in diapers. And so, you know, that's what they know. They can talk football sometimes better than than their than their high school or, or whatever programs they're in, you know, going on the way. Now, they all know the, the coach's thing. Like, hey, listen, I'm not going to go over here and question what a coach is teaching you or doing with you. Man. Not going to do I, I got to tell you a story about that, man. No, because it's like – I wouldn't want Mike – I don't mind. You can come watch practice and whatever. You can ask questions. But 
I wouldn't want one of my kids parents sitting in the stands and the kid running over to him every time he gets something wrong and I get on his butt. You know what I'm saying? No, I'm not going to do that to a coach. And so, you know, if they need or, or ask, I'm uh, anytime, anything I can do to help people, I'll gladly do, but you know, I'm not going to, I, I, yeah. I never raised my kid to do that. I, I don't know if you've, you probably haven't seen him play, but John Marshall's high school basketball team, they're basically like Oak Hill. I mean, okay. they have a freshman who's been offered by UVA. They have a guy that plays – he's from the Bronx, but he plays on Kevin Durant's TV show that they film in Richmond. And then they have another kid, Dennis Parker, who's going to NC State. And I took my son and a 23-year-old young coach to watch Bird play John Marshall. Okay. And John Marshall is on another level, man. And yeah. the one, the 23 year old kid was yelling about our team and Bird. And I told the guy, I said, Look, dude, I said, I don't care if Phil Jackson was sitting on that bench with mm -hmm. our players. Like, he ain't going to beat that John Marshall team. And my son, who's 11, he's a year older than your son, he's sixth grader. Right. He knows the code. Like, he came to me. And he was like, that wasn't cool, you know, what he was doing. Like, mm -hmm. coach wasn't yelling when we was getting beat by Highland Springs, 35 nothing. Right, but, right. You know, yeah. it's like yeah. they know the code, dude, you know? Yeah, oh, they, yeah because, uh, again, they're in it. They they read – Landon's not old enough. My 10-year-old old, isn't old enough to have social media yet, so he hasn't gotten to that yet. But my daughter had, you know, was old enough to see it, and so she's read – the when like the years the last year we had a tough year uh, year before we had a tough game against Jackson she read some of the stuff that was said and things like that and she understands like you know that's part of it but you know, generally those people that have that type of an opinion usually are the ones that have no clue what they're talking about you know I, I tell you man last night after the Grizzlies game I don't know who thought of Twitter spaces but they have a Twitter space for Grizzly fans. Okay. And I listen to those guys. And, those, yeah. and there's some women, too. Right. You would think that they know more than Taylor Jenkins. I mean, they, oh. they're telling him the rotations. It, you know, yeah. you should have known it was a backdoor cut. I mean, it, mm -hmm. it's funny, man. Like, listen, it's – and and at the FCS level, and we have a, we have some great fans, and we and the SWAC gets, has some great games where you have – a pretty you have some great fan bases in the swag you've got a lot of guys that should be nfl pro hall of fame coaches or you know should have played quarterback here could have done this could have done that but didn't and so now they're they're absolute experts but again it's the same people that i generally turn the tv down on because i just i can't you know until you're in it and done it and know it and it, and, and because when you've been in it and you've lived this life, this particularly, you know, in this college coaching life. I imagine the high school coaching life is probably the same way. Yeah. Until you've done it, I don't want to hear your opinion on it, honestly. I mean, because when, when you watch TV, mm -hmm. I mean, it's you're either a former player like Shannon Sharp, right. you're a former coach, or mm -hmm. you, you're like just a sports nerd like right. Skip Bayless, and you wrote right. the book, you know, God's yeah. Coach about Tom Landry, and you just rode the Dallas Cowboys to ESPN FS1. Right. So, you know, I can't remember who it was that told me that he coached pro football, but he said, man, all, all the newspaper guys are, media guys are, are just, you know, nerds that never played that write about the game. You know, <laughs> that, that was like the, the best thing I ever heard. I was like, man, that's a good point. Yeah, and, I, mean, I mean, heck, look at this podcast. I don't even know what I'm doing, but oh. I got a thing that, you know, it looks yeah. official. I don't know. I, I, I've been to, like I said, I've been to your clinic many a time. You've had some really good clinics, you know, it's full yeah. too. It was crazy. A couple of those yeah. times, those rooms, I was like, hold on, let me take my sweater off because I'm getting nervous here. I mean, uh, People were like, are you going to do the clinic and do the clinic? I mean, I had to rent that hotel last year. Yeah. And yep. if it got any bigger, like I would have had to go on down the street and it would have been double the price or <laughs> it wouldn't have been as many people. And yeah. people would have said, oh, it fell off. 
But I mean, there there was no way that I was going to be able to beat what we did last year. Like, right. because that was coming right off of COVID, man. It was yeah. packed. And everybody was just ready to get out, right? I know that yeah. when, I, when I walked into my room before my time to get set up, put my computer in there and everything, and I walked out to go get something to drink and came back and couldn't get in the room that I was supposed to speak in, I was like, <laughs> whoa. Which one of my coaches was running that room? They I, sat in there all day. They don't even leave. No, yeah. I mean, it was just, it was just so packed. Yeah. It was just it was, man. Know, it wasn't you enough for way through the crowd. It was like, oh man. Okay. I was like, man, you, you gotta people don't understand you gotta pay those hotels up front. Like they yeah. want cash. And oh, yeah. like I mean it, I was like, no, nah, I'm not do, I'm not doing it, man. I mean, because they said we couldn't have the clinic at the school. You know, they said uh, it was against compliance. Oh, you know, the the big dog said they couldn't come, it was a dead period. So maybe I just oh, need to well, do a yeah, clinic when it yeah. ain't the dead period. Yeah. But I I've really enjoyed doing this because I've gotten to talk to so many guys. I mean, I think we've already done 20, 24 episodes. Wow. Um, okay. You know, and, and, you know, my, my coaches had this channel yeah. um, and, you know, they were doing talking about NFL pro sports and I'm, I'm really not into that. Right. But um, I, the reason I started doing this is because <laughs> I got two of the guys to interview Billy Mills mm -hmm. and, I had all the questions written, and then I was behind the camera trying to tell them what to say, and then <laughs> I felt like they were screwing it up. Right. So, like, I got so upset. I was like, I'm, I'm just taking this thing over, man. I'm going right. to use the CFC clinic name, and I'm going to do it. And, you know, some guys, it's like the first time I did one, I, was, I, I left, and I called my girlfriend. I was like, that won't easy because some people don't want to talk. Like. Yeah. They, yeah. they they don't want to talk. They don't want to talk about what they do. Mm -hmm. Or like I had the coach from Pensacola, Florida. He was talking smack about Dion, saying he was a fraud. So like I wanted coach to come on mm -hmm. and he, he was just a nice guy. You know, right. he just a good guy. And man, I wanted him to talk junk about Dion. Gotta let know? it out, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, that goes back to, you know, guys just don't want you represent the school and everybody else. You don't want to be the one to put that out there. Eh, yeah, I can see that. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I guess guys get Twitter <laughs> fingers. Yeah, there you go. That's what it is. But then when the, when the camera's on you, you're not talking. But the thing, you know? like, what you just said, the thing that kind of got me, the guys don't want to talk about what they do. There's no secrets in football, man. It's yeah, a little on the film. It, I got to turn the film. I, if I can get your film, I can pretty much give, tell you what you're doing. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, it's, 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 it's like, like – we watched the Super Bowl with our players. Like last year, we watched the Super Bowl. And right. like basically, it was a four down or it was a five down. And like they were bringing four or bringing five. And right. it was like yeah. man free. It was like they were showing the coverage. I mean, yeah. Yeah. it was like, I mean, here we go. And you want like, you know, a genius. The only difference from from offense to offense and from you know from scheme to scheme is just what you're calling it. So don't don't on your slides, don't put down what you call it teach it though like teach it like you would teach your kid it because at the end of the day all of us learn this this game from someone yes you know? and those of us who have been in it long enough to where we're coordinating or have you know influence on what we're doing offensively like there's no it's not like i just oh god inspired me to know this no i saw somebody else do it and yeah. i like it and there's so nothing new. It. i mean sid gilman is the father of the modern passing game and he was pretty much doing everything back with the Chargers a long time right. ago. So yeah. you're right, man. Like, I've had some college guys tell me, well, I can't talk about what we do. Like, well, dude, just talk about your position. Talk about a play. Like, Vince yeah. Lombardi talked, what do they say, like six hours on the Packers sweep. Wow. So, man, I, <laughs> yeah. Hey, I mean, was it, was it was it Pop Warner that invented power? power Pop, uh, Pop Warner – I mean, he probably did. Pop Warner – wasn't Pop Warner uh, Jim Thorpe's coach? I, I'm pretty sure. But I want to say – but my point is is that I'm pretty sure when he did it, they were gapping down. Yeah. Kicking out and yeah. pulling the guard. Yeah, from the single wing, it's a kick, kick out and then a wrap. <laughs> I'm just saying. Yeah. like it's. I mean, yeah, you're right. It's football, man. And so Black now – Kick out, wrap. Yeah, Black now – so In front of you. Everybody block right. Everybody block left. Everybody hit, and so what I'm saying is like, but which way you slide in the protection? Well, we're sliding it towards Aaron Donald. Wow, 
I mean, you know, I'm sliding it away from the hot plan so I because that's who I'm throwing hot to. That's it. And if I, yeah, if I man, just turn that, it on the tape. So right. I, I, one, one last thing I want to ask you mm -hmm. is, you know, playing quarterback is like being the head coach because you – get the blame mm -hmm. when they lose and you get the credit when you win. Mm -hmm. um, and you sometimes like when, when Nick Saban says rat poison, is that like, do you think that's good or bad stuff? Like I think rat poison, when he says that, like, I think he's talking about the good stuff. Like when people tell you you're great, I think mm -hmm. that's probably the worst type. The rat poison is when they tell you you're great. So yeah. When, so what, what is your feeling about that? And, you so know. I stole a line from Muhammad Ali, who stole a line from, um, oh gosh, from the Beatles. And it was, the more real you get, the more unreal it's going to get, right? The yeah, better the more you are, you get, the more unreal it's going to get. The more unreal it's going to get, right? And and I think a lot of people take that as like the experiences are going to get in real. That's probably partly partially true. But for me, the more real you get, the more unreal it's going to get. The better you are, the more likely you are to have people around you telling you what you want to hear. Mm -hmm. So you want to kind of grab onto people that aren't afraid to tell you how it really is and sometimes tell you things that you don't want to hear or maybe you don't even believe. But tell me those and challenge me on it so that I can be sure that it's real. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, but you're absolutely right. Playing quarterbacks like being a head coach. You're the only people that get wins and losses. You get entirely too much credit and you get entirely too much blame. Right. At the end of the day, being but being a quarter at the end at the end of the day, that's your job. You have to deal with that. And you want a kid, at least in with our guys, you want guys that are willing to understand that and take it for what it is. Because again, everybody's gonna have an opinion, everyone's going to have a thought on what they should be doing. But if they were really that great at it, they'd still be doing it. So, you know. It's like, what is it? I think it's Jerry Glanville is like, don't listen to the people in the stands because if you do, you're going to be sitting next to them. Next to them, right. Pretty soon. Because given the choice, those people in the stands, given the choice, would rather be me than be sitting back there in the stands. <laughs> right? They'd rather be you going under center right now than sitting back there in the stands. And if they could be you or better than you, they would still be playing right now. Or if they could be me or better than me, they'd be coaching in my job right now. You just got to learn to to deal with people that are going to tell you the truth, period. Sit down like with our, with our quarterbacks. I'm not going to lie to you and tell you that you're better than you are. I'm going to try to build you up, yes, right? But I'm always going to be honest with you. Why? Because my job is dependent on your performance. If I'm telling you you're doing a great job and you really suck, I'm going to get fired. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? So, you know, at, at the end of the day, those are the people that you should gravitate to when you're in positions like that. Like I said, the more real you get, the more it's going to get. That's, that's great. I've never heard of that till today. Uh, uh, Bryce Young or C.J. Stroud? And both are California mm -hmm. guys. I like C.J. I Stroud's story, you know, the struggle that he went through with his dad going to prison. But I like Bryce Young at the end of the game like, playing in the pocket. I, I, I like Bryce for a couple reasons, but I'm, I'm going to go with just I like Bryce. I'm going to leave it alone. <laughs> oh, so you ain't going to say why you like him? Ew. Okay, I'm so gonna, right I mean, now. they're both really talented. Let's say it that way. Yeah, they are. Well, but I, I would take Bryce if I had to choose. And then, like CJ, he was kind of, he was kind of under under recruited. You know, he had to really I don't know from what I hear he he kind of came on the scene late. Um, who is the best quarterback in pro football? Like that's what everybody always talks about. Uh, I, I I was I was a big Brady person. Um, he grew on me. It took a while. Um, I think. Right now, actively playing, uh, Joe Burrow is is slowly but surely becoming the guy. Tom Brady. Yeah, yeah, a winner. Uh, accurate. I mean, super accurate. Uh, you know, now on the on the same coin, 
I would say that like a guy like Patrick Mahomes comes in, changes your whole offense. So, you know, it really kind of depends from, you know, from there, but what, you know, right now to me, Joe Burrow is showing a lot, you know, I guess we're going to have to wait to see, you know, Sunday. <laughs> yeah. Ne- next, next week, everybody will yeah. say, this guy's the greatest, yeah. whoever wins, whoever wins this week, like right? Josh yeah. Allen, man, Josh Allen's a bum now. Yeah. Everybody thinks, yeah. Right. Yeah, he's yeah. terrible. <laughs> So, so, brother, I appreciate you coming on, man. I had a lot of fun. We spoke for an hour, man. It was, oh, wow. We just oh, talked wow. about, you know, Everything. football and quarterback <laughs> play, and it yep. was awesome, man. We're going to do it again, okay? Cool. Yeah, anytime. Thank you, brother. All right. Take care. All right.